Meet Trevor Hawthorne, now known as D-4651. On the outside, he was an armed robber who murdered two people during a convenience store shootout in Texas. But now, since being condemned to death, he's been picked up for D-Class testing by the SCP Foundation. Now also meet junior researcher Dr. Julia Reed, an aspiring Foundation scientist with an undiagnosed heart condition. The kind of heart condition that doesn't mix well with a high-pressure job at the SCP Foundation. These two woke up on the morning of December 6, 2011, completely unaware of the fact that they were only hours away from causing one of the most devastating containment breaches Site-19 had seen in years. Many people died that day, but thankfully for everyone else, SCP-131 were there to save the day. When you think of a hero, you probably don't picture a pair of little cyborgs with one eye and the intelligence of a household cat. But this is the tale of how two of the most unassuming anomalies at Site-19 managed to save thousands of people from two of the site's most dangerous inmates. Open your eyes and keep them open. If you so much as blink, it's all over for you. How long can you hold it? Difficult, right? Now imagine you're having a staring contest with an entity that can kill you if you dare to blink for even a fraction of a second. Or even worse, a creature that could potentially kill hundreds or even thousands of people if your attention drifts from it for any amount of time. Try keeping your eyes open with that kind of crushing pressure. We're talking about two of the most deadly Euclid and Keter class anomalies out there. SCP-173, the killer sculpture, a violent Euclid-class entity that is incapable of moving while being looked at. If ever it's unobserved, it'll snap the neck of anyone nearby. SCP-689, known as Haunter in the Dark, is an equally dangerous and even more attention-demanding statue. These two entities are beyond dangerous. Even SCP-682 is terrified of the killer sculpture, and researchers have been considering the use of 689 to potentially eliminate the hard-to-destroy reptile for quite some time. Their greatest concern, though, is whether the 30-centimeter tall statue would cause too much collateral damage to Foundation personnel in the process. Trevor Hawthorne was part of the three-man D-Class detail meant to clean out SCP-173's containment chamber at regular intervals. While on cleaning duty, two D-Classes can keep staring at the sculpture while the other tidies up the cell, alternating turns to blink. But that morning, Trevor had woken up in his containment cell with a killer migraine, and soon that migraine would be killing far more than just him. The containment procedures in 689 cell were also a three-person job. 689 is a small green soapstone statue of a skeletal being sitting on a throne, believed to be some form of underworld death deity discovered by German archaeologists in India. This is a work of religious art that demands your attention, or you and anyone else who's ever seen this Keter-class nightmare will suffer a horrifying fate. Anyone who's ever seen the statue is infected by its anomalous effects. It must be observed constantly, or someone who's seen it in the past will suddenly drop dead of a severe health issue, like a stroke, or multiple rupturing organs. Like the god of death the statue represents, it appears on top of the dead body of whoever it just killed. If not continually paid attention to, it'll keep hopping from person to person until it's killed everyone who's ever looked at it. Its teleporting abilities and the fact that it poses a threat to so many make this a truly formidable foe. It's kept in a constantly lit cell and is observed by two members of D-Class personnel at all times. But a crucial third party in the containment of SCP-689 is a member of personnel at level 2 or above. They remain in a control room, wearing a special visor to prevent them from ever seeing 689 and becoming infected themselves. If the containment fails, it's their job to throw the kill switch on the D-Class observers to prevent them from becoming vectors for infection. Today, this job fell on Dr. Julia Reed. She was linked to the two observers via an audio feed, allowing her to remain in constant contact with them, and she had her finger on the activation key for a pair of explosive collars that were around the D-Class's necks. Little did they know, Dr. Reed's heart was its own time bomb. Now you know what we're up against. A snap-happy sculpture, and a teleporting death statue with a hit list containing everyone who's ever glanced at it. What can SCP-131 bring to the table 
the two small cycloptic anomalies have only one remarkable ability. They never blink. That, and a soft spot for humans. These safe class SCPs pose no threat to their handlers, and can even form attachments to researchers and other staff who show affection towards them. Of course, forming these bonds is discouraged by Site-19's director, because it can be distracting. But that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. The two iPods, known as SCP-131-A and SCP-131-B, are identical in appearance except for their colors. A is a burnt orange, and B is a mustard yellow. The two of them appear to communicate with one another via high-pitched squeaking noises, and also seem to have an innate ability to detect danger occurring in the vicinity, as well as danger occurring near individuals they've bonded with. Because of their inability to cause harm and their generally affectionate demeanor, the iPods are allowed to roam around Site-19, provided they keep out of the way of researchers and stay out of restricted areas. They seem to pretty much stick to the rules, though check-ins on A and B are required every hour just to be safe. As the iPods were moving freely around the facility, Trevor and another D-Class maintained a visual on the sculpture in its containment chamber, while a third man swept up the mixture of blood and excrement staining the concrete floors. Things were going fine, until Trevor's migraine got the better of him. A sudden flash of intense pain shot through his head, and in a moment of weakness, he made a terrible mistake. With an audible groan of pain, Trevor closed his eyes and forced his fingers to his temples. The groan had taken his fellow observer off guard, and the man's eyes flitted over to him for a fraction of a second. But a fraction of a second is all the sculpture needs. In an instant, Trevor and his fellow watcher had their necks snapped, and the third D-Class was murdered before he even had a chance to turn around. Containment protocol dictates that the door is to be sealed behind the cleaning crew while they're working with 173. But this time, perhaps due to complacency, the guards had neglected to reinforce the door. They got their heads twisted 180 degrees for their trouble. SCP-173 was loose. Mobile task forces were dispatched to aid in the recontainment effort as 173 began wrecking havoc around the facility. But things were about to get even worse. It seemed like business as usual over at the containment cell of SCP-689. Two D-Classes observed while Dr. Reed dictated to them over an earpiece from her control center. However, what Dr. Reed thought were just minor chest pains were actually the onset of heart failure. When the two D-Classes heard their supervisor experiencing a fatal heart attack on the other end of the line, they began to panic. This meant their attention wasn't entirely on SCP-689, and they were further distracted by the chaos SCP-173 was causing elsewhere in the facility, murdering researchers, guards, and maintenance workers alike, which led to power outages. The lights in 689's containment cell shut down. Guards were dispatched to execute the observers, as is protocol for 689 containment breaches. But the fact that resources were already stretched thin by the 173 breach caused a fatal error in judgment from a guard posted nearby. In a panic, he opened the door to find one D-Class dead with the statue perched on his body and the other one running straight for him in blind fear. The two collided and tumbled out into the hall. Both were now infected by 689's anomalous attention, and both were now doomed. Moments later, the two of them were dead, the statue perched on their bodies, accidentally catching the eye of several researchers and guards running to deal with the 173's situation. For these two deadly anomalies, it was becoming an all-you-can-kill buffet. The staff of Site-19 were now dealing with one anomaly that needed to be looked at constantly, and another that if you even glance at it, you are effectively infected with a fatal disease. The iPods, sensing an imminent danger nearby, immediately sprung into action. It would be up to these cute, harmless anomalies to save the terrified staff during this chaotic double containment breach. In a nearby hallway, a fleeing Foundation researcher heard the crunches of her colleagues' necks breaking behind her. 173 was getting closer. This thing couldn't be outrun. She turned and saw the statue standing there, just 10 feet away from her. A dead researcher laying on the ground in front of it. She was locked in a deadly staring contest with the sculpture. How long she could survive was now dependent on how long she could keep her eyes open, and it was getting harder by the second. She could feel her eyes drying. They burned under the ceiling lights. 173 just waited. This wasn't a contest she could win. In a final moment of terror, 
The researcher was forced to finally close her eyes and she waited for the crunch, but it never came. Instead, she heard familiar high-pitched squeaking noises. She opened her eyes, crying tears of relief as she saw SCP-131-A sitting behind 173, watching it with its constant, unblinking gaze. The killer sculpture was paralyzed by a cheerful little safe class anomaly. Across the facility, a similar situation had unfolded with SCP-689. The Statue of Death had claimed many lives, but SCP-131-B had swooped in and frozen the statue in place with its never-ending gaze. Soon after, a mobile task force with vision-blocking visors used advanced echolocation technology to collect SCP-689 and return it to its containment cell. Everyone who'd seen the anomaly was, as standard protocol dictates, gathered up for later termination. Meanwhile, a mobile task force returned the paralyzed 173 back to its containment cell with a forklift. No containment breach is ever a picnic. Containment breaches with multiple dangerous anomalies are even less so, but the heroic role that SCP-131 played in bringing things back under control was indispensable. After all, it's not just raw power that counts when it comes to anomalies. The only anomalous power 131 needed to save the entire site was its ability to keep looking when nobody else could. They're so effective in this role that they've been seriously considered for permanent roles as wardens for SCPs like 173 and 689. And in our opinion, they're more than qualified. Now check out SCP-999 The Tickle Monster and SCP-5031 Yet Another Murder Monster for more surprisingly wholesome anomalies under the care of the SCP Foundation.